I think it's very important to, to emphasize that. Um, traditionally, Africans didn't have the same kind of value system that we have today. Mm. Um, we place value on things. And that's very important because people here in Sierra Leone always say that they didn't know what a diamond was. They would see it and be and like, yo, what is that? And they tell a story about when the, when the Europeans first came here to Kano, which is one of the major diamond producing places on earth. They went there and the people were like, yo, what is this? And they said the white man told them it's the devil. And the people was afraid of it because they said it had some evil omen on it. And he's, and they say the white man said, well, let me just get them. Let me just remove them all from you. You'll be all right. And start taking them. They said until later on, they didn't understand what the diamonds meant. During the war, they said, OK, well, now people really realize what they've been robbing us for the last 60, 70 years, that it got executive outcomes from South Africa here fighting right. um, in a civil war, that it got the whole Ekamog here fighting in the civil war because those who were leading the rebellion seized control of the diamonds. The back made people understand like, damn, you know, it's worth all that because we don't know the value of what we possess. And then we, when they come, they tell us how much they're gonna pay us for it. Just like with the cocoa, just like with every other resource in Africa. That, now real quick, what I want to do, uh, Chief Fode, what I want to do just briefly is to shift gears um, yeah. because we've gone a lot into the history, we've gone a lot into the background, and if it's just me and you, we, we'll be here until tomorrow morning, you know, we could just uh, jump in because I can tell that you like me in that regard. Um, as you was talking, I was also thinking about the role of Tataza and uh, Alda ghosts, right? So in uh, classical Nyani, that's what they call Mali, uh, and then in Gao, also known as Songhai, that there were a lot of uh, battles and whoever was able to get Takaza, the salt mines, they said even the buildings there were made out of slabs of salt. They didn't even have anything other than slabs of salt. That one See? and then Alda Ghost was one of the major gold mines. So if you lose Alda Ghost, right, which was sacked by the Almoravids, then basically that's the end of your financing of your empire. But what I want us to also do, and not to cut you, so if you want to land on the point you were making, feel free to, what I want us to do is shift into specifically the repatriation. We've set things up beautifully in terms of the background, but I know a lot of people who are on the line right now are interested in repatriating. I know a lot of those who are on the line right now, we set things up initially about terms, right? Time, energy, resources, money, spirit, and how yes, we uh, give a lot of that to our cave beast enemies and we need to redirect it towards building a black nation. So I also want us to, you know, at least briefly go into that for those who are interested in repatriating, let's say to Sierra Leone, what help could people get in repatriating the Sierra Leone? For repatriate to Ghana, you know, you're looking at one of those who can assist you in terms of repatriating to Ghana, assisting, you know, when you go to the site, you see several different testimonials. And we basically have them set up in terms of areas. So somebody who was interested in buying land, you know, assisting them in that regard, those who are interested in citizenship, assisting them in that regard, those interested in housing, assisting them in that regard, uh, those interested in residence permits, assisting them in that regard. So um, those who want to go back to the university, of course, you know, I'm at one of the major universities here. So I can, you know, speak to it, but I also want you to kind of shift gears. Um, you know, from the background to now on the ground, if people are interested okay. in repatriating, how can they do that? What are the nuts and bolts of repatriation? If people are interested in investing their time, what are the nuts and bolts of investing your time, their energy? What does that look like? Their resources? What does that look like? Their money or materials? What does that look like? Their spirit and then giving their own space? What does that look like? So if you can touch on those points directly, Definitely appreciate it. And sorry to okay. cut you. No, it's, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine, actually. Um, yeah, I can touch on those. And I would like to touch on them within the context of um, the work that we're doing here as well, because I did want to touch on that. And it's directly connected to it. First of all, 
Um, I would say that Ghana is way, way, way more um, advanced in having resources and um, and people prepared to assist with repatriation than what Sierra Leone is. And I don't say that as a discouragement. I say that as encouragement mm -hmm. because um, Ghana is an example. Ghana is definitely leading the way in terms of African repatriation in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's not only Ghana. You know, in reality, these um, these borders don't exist, you know? Um, but since they do, and we're still playing the nation state system, you still have other states. And, and, and since I'm here in Sierra Leone, and we're doing a lot of work to help people acquire their citizenship, as well as help with their investments, of um, even business investments, that's where I really want to be able to um, to respond on. So first of all, let me just back up all the way to the beginning. For those who may have joined since the beginning, um, my name is Chief Fode Ajamu Mesire, um, and I'm a repatriate. I've been living in Freetown, Sierra Leone the last eight years. I've been in Senegal. I, I've stayed uh, six months in Guinea, Conakry. Um, I trace my roots back to Mandingo people as well as Bamalike people in Cameroon. And um, I'm a Gullah Geechee, born and raised in the United States of America. Um, bonafide Garvey Act. There's nothing I love more than African people and African culture. And our struggle as well to get free. You gotta love it. You gotta love it. It's worthwhile. And um, so we have three organizations that's centered on trying to bring more attention to Sierra Leone and assist those who are coming this way. When I got here in 2013, there was, no, I won't say there was nobody, but there was no repatriates here to assist me. And um, I didn't need it because I came with, with indigenous, I came with natives, you know, I came as a guest. And so I, I had that benefit. I didn't come here with an already existing repatriate community. But since I've come here, I've been able to meet people who frequently visit. Also, I've been joined by other people who have um, recently repatriated. My wife, two elders as well. And I've learned of others who have come and, and gone that will be returning, just in terms of the repatriation of Sierra Leone. Um, one of the things that we have been fighting for here in Sierra Leone is for citizenship. And what you can do for citizenship here is um, we have an organization called the Gullah Leone Union. The Gullah Leone Union is actually a multi-organization front. We have three nonprofits that comprise the Gullah Leone Union. The, um, we have Gunona, which is the Gullah Nation of North America, um, nonprofit organization, 501c3 in the United States. We have the Gullah Redemption Mission Sierra Leone, which is a nonprofit company here in Sierra Leone with a um, licensed, licensed travel and tourism company. We have a, uh, a community-based organization where we engage in um, social economic development projects in the communities to empower our people from our Be Clean campaign to our Tools and Seeds Seed Farmers Assistance Project. Um, you can go to www gullahleon.org and, and find out more about that. Um, so we've been assisting repatriates as well in the way of helping them to acquire their citizenships. Uh, for those who know or don't know, Sierra Leone is the first country in Africa to grant citizenship based on African ancestry DNA tests. Um, Isaiah Washington, the Hollywood actor, was the first to obtain it. Um, and over the last two years, over 30 people DNA testing. Um, in that, before any of them ever came, my wife and I, um, who were here building Basani, the Black Star Action Network International, which is a pan-Africanist organization anchored on the, philo the philosophy of Garveyism and directly connected to the UNIACL RC 2020 um, government. What we have been able to do here, and that's really the first organization that was established here in Sierra Leone when I came home. Founded in 2009, launched in 2012, 
um, repatriated in 2013 and really paved the way for what you see happening here now. Um, an aggressive, independent, self-determined, Garveyite grassroots community-based organization. We see investment as service and, um, and, 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 and action. And so these three different entities come together to form one union. Um, through that, we've been able to assist those, those coming with their ancestry, DNA, certificates, seeking to go to hook up with the right government people. Um, in 2006, 16, my wife and I was able to um, receive one brother who came through, actually through the, through the Gullah Nation connection, um, through our, our late chief, Harold Hillary. He connected us with the brother, said, hey man, this brother is coming. If you can connect him to his people, it'd be great. He was a Timini descendant. Hmm. When he came, we took him to the monuments and relics, and they told us to, to get a petition started, told us to sign, you know, go back to the people who want the citizenship and get a petition done and turn it over to the government, and then the government can go through its own procedures and tell us what they can do. Somewhere in that, um, the Gullah Geechee people who were requesting for our citizenship, as well as the African ancestry DNA people ended up getting split up. And then I see that the people in African ancestry are now split up among themselves. And, um, it's, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of infighting and, and struggles going on just in the citizenship thing. But we were there at the first meeting. We actually arranged the first meeting for these new group of people coming because after Isaiah Washington got his citizenship, he closed that door. That door wasn't open back up for nobody else hmm. until we went there with the first brother who came. And we, we connected him back with his people and, and everything like that. And that's pretty much what we've been doing. Um, every year we get several groups, people coming back, looking, look, looking to reconnect with the grassroots. And so it's very important to understand how the union works and how we service people when they come. So Gullah Redemption Mission is Sierra Leone, which we have a tour company through, we're licensed. And the African Ancestry DNA test or any other DNA test that you have that will show your um, maternal or paternal ancestry connected to Sierra Leone with a certificate, you then can go through a process to request your citizenship. But you have to go through that process through a licensed company. And so we are a licensed company that's set up to assist you in that way. We work with the Ministry of Culture and Tourism directly through the Monuments and Relics for that purpose. So we're here. We're here investing our time to make sure that those who's coming behind us already have the door open for them. Like I said, when I got here, I didn't find anyone operating in this capacity. I didn't find many resources that were already there. Um, this country went through a war. 11-year uh, war. I came in 2013. Ebola broke out in 2014 and 15. I was here. And, um, you know, so just to get people to come back to Sierra Leone, there's a lot of stigma there. So we kind of use the history a lot to teach people the connection. And then with the DNA tests and the citizenships coming, Sierra Leone is becoming more and more favorable. It's becoming more and more um, favorable for a lot more people. So what uh, what we're doing now is we, we host a monthly workshop, which is a, um, we call it the free game workshop. For those who are seeking to learn more about how they can go about acquiring citizenship in Sierra Leone, there's several ways to do it. It's not just through DNA testing. Sierra Leone has a very short stay before you can request. You only have to be here for five years as a resident or maintain your residency for five years. You don't have to stay in the country. You can go and come, but you won't need a visa. Do business in the country for five years and you can request your citizenship. Um, you can marry, of course. There's different, different ways. Um, in terms of people who would like to, um, you know, come home as investors, business people, we also provide consultancy services and we also provide um, um, management assistance, which brings me to my last point as well. Um, everything that we're doing here in Sierra Leone is not isolated to Sierra Leone. The Gullah Leone Union and its, and its organizations are directly connected to other bodies that are directly connected to um, this repatriation movement, like the Sankofa Repatriation Assistance Program, which is being ran by Sister, um, Sister Yap out of Ghana. She's doing great work. I believe she just got 
land for 30 different people like like in, in one purchase um and they're in the diaspora able to work with the sister and secure land in ghana legally and legitimately in a transparent way where um they're safe and they don't have to worry about scamming or none of that kind of stuff sister yeah is the real deal because she's showing that she can do that and deliver that um then there's there's also um other repatriates who's taking you know different approaches like um, brother R.J. Maldi, Rashad Maldi, and his wife Aliyah in Senegal, where they have a Made in Africa um, project where they're actually um, fostering the building of a, of a city in Senegal and have been assisting Africans traveling, investing, and repatriating to Senegal since they reached there a few years ago. So um, we are connected, and us three along with other organizations like the State of African Diaspora, um, UNICL, we um, we affiliate with ourselves. We understand that our organizational um, um, entities don't mean that we're different people. It just means that we're operating in different capacities. And so we've been trying to bring it together. Um, Basani focuses mainly on grassroots organizing. You'll see, if you go to our website, you see that we are absolutely grassroots we work with the people um every single day we have established the african diaspora village as a temporary um, um office space a permanent headquarters for us but a temporary office space for those who are coming who will want to be, be doing work because we have a non-profit company you can invest by coming to be a volunteer through the company or through any company or nonprofit that's established that does that kind of thing. We want to begin to do exchange, student exchange. People can come here and do their internships and agriculture and every other thing that we need to learn or relearn back in the diaspora, the institute in our communities. So um, we together, um, six organizations, Made in Africa, Exodus, um, um, no, not Exodus, I'm sorry, State of African Diaspora, UNICL, um, 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 Bosani, and, and uh, what is the other? Yeah, the Exodus. We all came together to form an alliance of organizations that will be focused on organizing the mass exodus of our people who's very serious and ready to come home and assuming the responsibility for us to um, maintain a network of service to our people. So what we have done under the leadership of Brother Rashad Mardi, he's really demonstrated a leadership in terms of um, how to professionalize the services that we seek to provide. And one of the steps that he's taken is that he's, he's created under the Made in Africa um, brand, the Exodus Club. And the Exodus Club is a club membership Whereas if you want to come to Africa, you know you're going to need consultancy, you're going to need help looking for land, you're going to need help renting a place, you're going to need help looking for a job, then we are set up to be repatriate assistants. We are set up to be able to help you get from where you are in the diaspora to where you want to be successfully on the continent like we have. You understand? So it is an alliance formed for that. And the club um, allows for people to pay um, for a consultancy and a management facilitation that will save you so much time and so much headache and and, and, uh, and, and provide you with a, a system of support. We share information. You know, if someone's in Ghana and they're headed to Sierra Leone and they need somebody to plug into, you know, Sister Yaya said, hey, go check out Chief Fode in Kenya. If somebody's here and, they, and I know they're going down and they, I know they're going to Gambia, you know, I'm gonna shoot them over to to uh, to uh, Sister Katura or or, or or one of the Exodus members who are there, and um, that's how we've been coordinating and organizing ourselves so that we can support more of our people um, in a unified way. So that's that's what we're doing. We're really working hard to demonstrate not only how how to come back, but how to stay and how to build in that process while helping others. So we have built a process um, for that. And we encourage people to, you know, it's uh, $999, $1,000 for a lifelong consultancy and management membership with the Exodus Alliance. 
um, through Made in Africa. And when I say that, I mean it, man, because when I came here, I didn't have access to those resources. I had to learn everything for myself. And if I could have just paid a thousand dollars and had some uh, successful and professionally oriented, trained repatriates who wasn't going to snake me or jerk me or play me here already, then I believe that even now, after eight years, I may have been um, two years ahead of myself right now. And so investment um, in that way is also um, a way to look at it as well. Providing the services, make, building the networks, you know, connecting with the real estate companies here, you know, knowing who the Minister of Lands is, knowing who the Minister of Tourism is, knowing who the, who the Minister of Trade and Industry is, you know, connecting with the media here, connecting with the schools here. Right now, we have a 12 city, a, a 12 school workshop tour that we're about to launch um, so that we can teach hygiene and the diaspora connection to Sierra Leone to um, students in primary and secondary schools. This is the investment. Those children will learn about the diaspora connection as well as something very, very valuable that can be life-saving in a condition like Freetown, Sierra Leone. How to properly wash your hands with soap and when to do that um, can save lives. And so we do that work. We organize um, um, mass cleanups. And so for those of you who are out in the diaspora looking to invest in the continent, it's not always something that you would get immediate monetary gain from. But when you invest in programs and projects like the Be Clean campaign, like the Tools and Seeds program, what happens is that you assist in building the capacity for those on the ground that are servicing you as you come to be able to service you better by making sure that the people are benefiting ahead of you. I always say it all the time. I was already here six years before I got here because I was investing. I was investing my time. I made myself available. There was times where people from Africa, from here would call me and I'd be in Pennsylvania and they would say, hey brother, they locked up comrades such and such. We need your help. And before I know it, I was asking my friends to call, to call to help these journalists get out of prison. You know, um, there's so many different ways that we could really embrace us and want to see us go ahead. And so we are over here accumulating those resources and presenting them to our people. And when I say a thousand dollars, don't get afraid of money. You're going to have to spend money in Africa if you're repatriating. So we do provide a lot of services. Anyone who in particular are seeking to um, repatriate to Sierra Leone can definitely contact us. You can send an email out to info at Um, You can go and see all of our things. We do have a YouTube channel. We are not um, YouTubers. Um, we are not just going live to get people to follow us for likes. If you go to our YouTube channel, which is Gullah House Media, what you'll find is that we showcase what we do. We Everything that we do, you'll go there and see the transparency of our community operations. You won't see us there um, asking for money, even though we do have a um, development fund. We do have a fundraiser permanently to help us with our projects. That's not why we're on that social media outlet. We're there so that you can see the work that we do and, um, and have access to us. So again, www.gullahleon.org. And I encourage anyone coming back to the continent who will be going to any of the countries where we have Exodus members from Ghana, Gambia. Um, I believe we have membership in Kenya, um, um, Senegal or Sierra Leone for now. And we, we hope to expand. If you're out there and you want to be a part of this Exodus Alliance and this Exodus Membership Club where we're providing repatriation and investment consultancy assistance, then um, reach out. Reach out. Have, you know, let's, 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 let's organize and mobilize these services because the best investment in the liberation of Africa is service. Thank you. All right, black plastic, black plastic, Sharon, right there. You know, as you were telling, you know, I could tell you're a natural storyteller because as you're telling the story or narrating, you know, your life's experience, you can see it, right? You can feel it. And it's
Hello? Not sure what's going on. Doing Senegal and the Gambia, but then of course. But I can start talking anyway, anyway, just just to fill it up to the brother and get back on. Um, but it's very, very important. We stand repatriation and the response. Okay, sorry. I think I got a glitch in my system over here. Okay, no problem. All right. Yeah, I was just about to say that, you know, back in 98, can everyone hear me well? Can everyone hear me well? I can hear you. Yes, I can. Yeah, so back in 98, so I must have been like uh, 18, 19 years old. My mother brought me here to Ghana, and she first came to Ghana in 1972 with yeah. Ghana Dinizulu. Um, you know, he had the Dinizulu dancers and drummers, and they were going to train at Latte to be a in the account spiritual system. Now, you know, with this, it was really profound that, you know, initially she was bringing me here in 98, and I was just like, okay, this is mom's thing. You know, I'm supposed to be a good child. Let me just go along and do what mom is doing. But I had a very, very serious transformation where between that first time I came and the second time I came, I really got into the language. And I got into the language because I was interested in the worldview and really re-Africanizing. I read a book called The Sankofa Movement, Re-Africanization and the Reality of War. And I was like, the only way to re-Africanize in my eyes was to really learn the language because that's where all yeah. the concepts all the ideas yes. were and really where we are right now at bb to me it was founded 15 years ago um you know actually in this month and part of the idea was to teach people not just anything related to these neo-colonial cages because for me i speak chi but then also yoruba and then also wolof mainly spoken in senegal and gambia kiswahili kikongo and then a smattering of another 50 you know or more languages so that was always the vision and where we are right now we're actually expanding a bb to me now we're off it's going to come through the language right and learning the language that's one now for those who are interested you can also check that out sankofajourney.com It may be a good idea to to turn off the videos so people who have the have videos on maybe if you could turn it off it may stabilize the connection for people who have low bandwidth but I can keep talking while he Getting back online, uh, he was talking about the Sankofa journey. Oh, he's back. Go ahead. All right, can everybody hear me well? All right, can everybody hear me well? Yeah. Yeah, Nana Kwame, I was suggested maybe, uh, except for you, if people could turn off their video cameras. I saw a couple other cameras were on. Uh, so for people with low bandwidth, it may help. Hello. Can everybody hear me well? Yeah, I got you over here. Yes, I can. I can open you.
Okay, I don't know if people can hear me, but looks like he fell off again. Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Um, yeah, yeah, so uh, I was just going to share the links that he, uh, I posted the links that he just mentioned, the Sankofa journey.com. Um, Sankofa journey was started in, uh, I think 1998 by, uh, Dr. Mawia Kanban or Nana Efia Insia Asantawa, uh, who is, uh, uh, uh Nana Kwame's mother. And, uh, his first experience coming to Ghana was with her. Like he said, um, uh, both of us actually were like, oh, that's her thing. Um, but uh, it became a transformative experience. I'll, go, okay, uh, I'll let him tell you the story about him coming. But I will say that um, once I'll I go. really came to Ghana, okay, I think hey. he's back. So uh, I was encouraging people to, uh, in the chat history, look at SankofaJourney.com. And and look at some of the, the testimonials there. I think the most compelling ones are how people talked about the just the experience and the weight that's lifted off your shoulders when you get off the plane and step onto soil and you're you know surrounded by and seeing black faces. Um, in contrast when you step off the plane in New York or DC and you realize that, you know, you spent two weeks in Ghana and saw almost no white people <laughs> and it's a very stark contrast to what you see in the airport in DC and New York or, or New York when you land. But the Sankofa journey is designed to not give you the touristy experience of living in Ghana, um, it's uh, I compare it to if you were to travel to the United States uh, for two weeks and you only saw the Washington Monument um, or the obelisk there and you only saw uh, the Statue of Liberty and the tourist spots and then left and said, oh, I know exactly what it's like to live in America. You would be very wrong. <laughs> um, similarly, uh, the Sankofa journey is not designed, even though there are some uh, significant historic spots that you see, it's really designed to, to reconnect you with an African experience, a traditional African experience that values uh, all of the things that we have not been able to live out because we've been ripped away. So uh, if you have not been to Ghana, Many of uh, people, myself included, uh, I had never, even though this is part of my family, I had never thought about living here. And it wasn't until the Sankofa journey in, I think, 2018, where I was so, I didn't, because I decided to, to look at it, not like I was on a vacation, but like I was actually, looking at, wow, these are really my brothers and sisters and look at what people are doing. And this is the kind of life I could build here. It's an incredible preview into the kind of life you can have meeting the kinds of people who can be impactful from a social You know, uh, you know, two weeks is not of the top five experiences that I've had in my life. The Sankofa Journey 2018 was was repatriate to Ghana. Uh oh. So I'm also going in and out. So it looks like the whole connection. I'm sorry. Um, so again, if people can turn off your videos, I do see there's still one more video. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, definitely the Sankofa journey uh, definitely changed my life. I am here in Accra now. Uh, and what I also recognize is that even though I'm here, 
life here in Accra is definitely, I mean, life here in Ghana is definitely even different than that experience where, because uh, Nana Kwame and Nana Mawia know people and have connections that are so deep and broad that, uh, you know, you're not going to meet these people in your everyday life. So, um, you know, just that experience is incredible. So I am planning on going on the journey again um, the next time. Uh, but also um, what has been great is some of the people who came on the Sankofa journey have used that ability to travel around the country and see different cities um, see different areas, like, do I want to live near the beach or the mountains or the, you know, near the forest or near farmland, you know, seeing all of those things uh, on the journey gave people a better understanding of if I move to Ghana, when I move to Ghana, what area would I like to be in? What kinds of, you know, who would be the kind of people that I get to interact with on a daily basis? What would my life be like? Um, and so Repatriate to Ghana and the Sankofa journey are a good pairing um, so that, you know, especially if you've never been here before, uh, you can you can get, a, you know, just a really good example. So um, hopefully I'm sure the connection with others makes Repatriate. Yeah. So um, most of the people who I hang out with now on a weekly basis I met because I came on the Sankofa journey. Um, uh, I was just talking to a sister today who uh, I met through an organization that I, I only found because I came on the Sankofa journey. So um, it, it does make connecting with others a lot easier. Um, also because Nana Kwame teaches some of the tree language and also uh, tree language instruction is taught in the Repatriate to Ghana packages, you, um, it, it, it definitely makes communicating better. Uh, there's a brother who's not been here as long as I have and he's already speaking tree and I'm still struggling a little bit. <laughs> so um, the language part is also uh, important and you learn some on the Sankofa journey so you can communicate, you know, some general things. And with Repatriate to Ghana, you learn more so that you can really communicate locally. And I would not undervalue the importance of learning the local language tree because uh, when you when you speak the language, uh, the, someone recently uh, said a term that there's an accent tax. So when you don't speak the language, uh, there is a tax placed on everything that you purchase immediately, uh, and it may be five to ten times what anything is worth. So uh, Nana Kwame will tell you the story of someone who thought, oh, I don't need repatriate to Ghana. I know plenty of people in Ghana who can get me set up. And the guy bragged about, you know, he bought like six air conditioners in his house and he got them for the bargain price of thirteen hundred dollars. Um, uh, he paid for this and that. And, you know, uh, I think he paid to get some residency stuff done and he paid five hundred dollars per person and he has six people in his family so that was three thousand dollars and uh nana kwame could have gotten him the same thing for his whole family for 600 ghana cds which is less than a hundred dollars so he paid three thousand dollars because and and the, the so the repatriate to ghana package that he was looking at um, was $2,500 and he thought it was too expensive yet he ended up spending $1,300 $1, per air conditioner and then he spent six oh I'm sorry I said $3,000 uh, Nana Kwame said he paid $6,000 $1,000 per person uh, whereas he could have paid 600 Ghana CDs uh, which would have been about $100 so the again the repatriate the Ghana package that he thought he didn't need was twenty five hundred dollars, and uh, it could have saved him. Uh, actually, when we did the math on the 
five things that he listed, uh, he probably could have saved about fifteen thousand dollars. Peace, this because he also. So paid for health care unnecessarily. Uh, he paid a team of medical experts to help his wife uh, with something that could be cured with uh, leaves from a tree that uh, grows on every corner. So just, you know, it's these kinds of things that you get with Repatriate to Ghana. Um, not to mention, um, uh, I hate to admit that uh, I, I do still have um, one of those social networks um, because it is a main form of communication for a lot of my um, people here. And uh, about six people this week, different people, different areas, uh, a dance friend, uh, a, a friend who's in a vegan group, another friend who's a, social, uh, uh, a work contact sent me an article where they were like, oh, your brother was just on this. Oh, your brother was just on this. Oh, he was on this. And so he is everywhere and knows so many people in media, so many people. Uh, he set up a meeting for me um, with someone who works at the um, president's office. And, you know, comparatively, even though we don't value <laughs> the office of the president in the United States, but, you know, if you think of your average friend or your best connection in the US, what are the chances that they can get you an audience with someone who works at the pres at the White House? You know, so um, these are the kinds of things that you get access to with both Repatriate to Ghana and, you know, and in some ways with the Sankofa journey. So I definitely encourage people to look at that because what it does when you're moving is it sets up the kind of foundation for you to actually have a successful transition to a, a country where everything is different. And I cannot stress enough how different it is to live here versus um, living anywhere, you know, like the States, like the United States or anything. Um, but with some of these resources, it is, um, you know, it's it's less of a culture shock. You, there will be things that will shock the heck out of you. I won't, you know, <laughs> there will be things where you're like, why do they do it this way? Um, but, you know, having these relationships is, is invaluable. Um, and the one other one I want to point out, I know there was a sister, uh, an elder who came here and she didn't know what she didn't know. And she got uh, trapped into a lease at a place that she was not even that she wasn't comfortable with. She she talked about feeling alone and um, things were falling apart. And he was able to uh, get her out of that lease um, and help her relocate to a community of other elders. Uh, near the beach that a, a community she didn't even know existed. Uh, and he was able to negotiate and get her money back. And I cannot stress enough how how refunds in this country are, are non-existent. <laughs> when you buy something, if you buy it and it is not working 30 seconds later, people are like, I'm sorry you spent your money, uh, especially with housing. It is, it is almost unheard of. So the fact that he was able to get this woman back her money um, on, on what was probably a one or two year prepaid lease is incredible because that allowed her to be able to set up her new life in this new community. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that you don't know could happen. And if you're alone when it does happen, there, you know, it it, it is a very lonely orphan like feeling to not have that kind of support. And, and so, yeah, uh, I did see that someone said, I have a question Tyrone uh, about home ownership. Is there such thing as yearly, a, a yearly home property tax? So um, I think this, this activity is more high level and yeah, I, you, we can hear you now. Okay. All right, so as far as that goes, it really depends on where the home is located. If it's in a more rural environment, then people aren't coming to you for property tax because there are many homes that are built in rural areas that are just absolutely, you know, off the beaten path. And it wouldn't even be 
feasible given you know the country's resources to try to go to all of these various homes. So one of the major things, if you're in Accra, then most likely you will have to deal with something along those lines. But in the more rural environments, then you wouldn't have to be dealing with that type of thing. This thing, uh, what Steven Taylor is mentioning uh, in terms of the 99 year lease, there is what's called an indenture. And what I actually have is an indenture where you own the land outright. And that's also what I got for another brother. His testimonial is also on Repatriate to Ghana at the same length. So what Stephen is saying is what's the case for most people. However, if you know certain things and if you know Repatriate to Ghana, what you're able to do is get um, a, a deed, right? So this is a deed and as part of your indenture, it's not any type of lease. It's not the 49 year lease, it's not the 99 year lease. You can actually get your land outright in an indenture, right? What's called a deed of conveyance. This is to say that they're conveying the land to you. So if, if you're interested in actually purchasing land without having to deal with what's on the books, which is what you know Stephen is giving you, and that is the books, right? But in Ghana, things do not always operate on the books. And if you have connections and if you know people, then fully legally, you can have a deed of conveyance. And it's just about, you know, sometimes having inroads into that community, having, you know, built relationships based on trust. And then they're willing to write up the agreement in such a way that it goes straight to you into perpetuity, meaning that your, your great, great grandchildren's great, great grandchildren will remember you as the ancestor who made sure that they had the land that they're sitting on right now. So these are things that we also deal with in terms of repatriate to Ghana. Other things I wanted to talk about, and Nataki is my sister. She's also my best publicist. So she'll let you know about some of the things, just some of the different anecdotes. And those are actual real cases. A brother who came, he came and he, we were sitting by the poolside at University of Ghana. He was like, yeah, I paid a thousand per person. And he got a family of six. He said, yeah, I paid a thousand per person. Do you think that was a good deal? Now I just got a brother his uh, residence permit for 1,000 Ghana CDs, and that's somewhere around 170 there upon you know dollars. Now, as opposed to doing that, is it basically comes down to being penny smart and pound foolish. So rather than working with Repatriate to Ghana, he ended up spending 